which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for your prayers. Now Sharon's going to come and bless us. This will be a great song.
had some great music here around Christmas time, and it's a blessing to receive it. We're going to turn to Scripture now and receive directly from the mind and heart of God what it is He would like us to know and understand about a race of beings that He has created to serve Him in heaven and also to serve us on earth. The angels figure prominently in the stories of Christ's birth, so it's appropriate for us to take some time today to come to understand what angels are in Scripture. And so uh, we've got kind of a formidable job ahead of us. You need to wear your thinking cap, but also your track shoes, because we're going to have to go quickly today to get this overview of what Scripture tells us about angels. So let's start by revisiting the account of the appearance of the angels that heralded the birth of Christ to the shepherds. This is from Luke chapter 2. We will read today verses 8 to 15. Luke 2, starting with verse 8. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them. Do not be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Now, today as we are uh, taking an overview and looking at several different scriptures, it will probably be uh, even a little more helpful to you if you have your message notes uh, there in the bulletin so that you can keep track of where we're at. You'll have the scripture passages to which I refer, and uh, we won't spend very much time, obviously, on any one of them, but instead we're going to... Uh, get a, a, a general sense, but a biblical sense of this race of beings called angels. Now we're going to approach this just a little differently as well. Uh, the, you notice the title of the message is God's Gophers, and uh, the word gopher is an actual word. It's in the Scrabble Dictionary, which for me is the ultimate. If it's in the Scrabble Dictionary, it's a word. I don't. You can say what you want to about Oxford and Cambridge and yada, 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 but it's the Scrabble Dictionary that really makes a difference, doesn't it? This word is used to describe uh, the menial labor that someone has to go for this or go for that, and it's been uh, in use since 1967. So it's a term that's been with us for quite a while. Daniel Scarpati worked as a gopher in Hollywood. His new book, titled Gophers on the Front Line of Film and Television, explores the behind-the-scenes work of gophers in the entertainment industry. After working for six years as a gopher, Scarpati started his own production company and wrote this book because he realized that 
Nobody had ever written a book about being a gopher. And I quote, the many responsibilities of a gopher include taking breakfast orders, carrying and distributing the paperwork, helping keep the set clean, knowing where the bathrooms are, knowing the paths to and from each set, keeping track of the last person leaving the set to go to lunch, returning all signed paperwork to the office, collecting walkie-talkies and charging them overnight. That's a lot of different kinds of responsibility, isn't it? He said the four biggest things to remember as a gopher, have a thick skin. He says that uh, gophers get scolded for the silliest things by actors, producers, and directors. In entertainment production, he says, things move fast and don't often pause for feelings. Now, it may seem a little disrespectful for us to apply the term gopher to angels. But their duties require them to go for this or go for that while doing the will of God. And it may seem a little silly to represent angels as a little winged gopher with a halo. But I'm hoping that comic image will stick with you and be a reminder to you in days ahead of what angels are and what they do for us and for God. What we're going to learn today, friends, is that angels are the other race God created. Angels are not resurrected people. They're an entirely different race that God brought into being. They are his servants who minister to us. So we'll start, number one, God created angels to serve him. And the first thing we need to know about that point is that God created angels. Psalm 148, verse 5 says, Let every created thing give praise to the Lord, for he issued his command, and they came into being. Everything came into being at the Lord's command. He commanded, they were created. That includes angels. Secondly, let's look at the particulars of what angels do. First of all, Psalm 103, verses 20 and 21, tell us that they are mighty, but obedient. They are mighty, but they obey God. Praise the Lord, you angels, you mighty ones, who carry out his plans listening for each of his commands. Yes, praise the Lord, you armies of angels who serve him and do his will. You see, angels wield heavenly power to do earthly things. Their power is not their own. It comes from God, and they use it to do his will. Second, Hebrews 1.14 and we'll refer to this again later. They are spiritual beings. Hebrews 1.14 tells us, Therefore angels are only spirit, servants, spirits, it says, sent to care for people who inherit salvation. They have a spiritual being. We are physical beings, mortal beings. That's not true of the race of angels. Hebrews 13, verse 2, this is their third description of angels. They can take physical form. Hebrews 13, 2, they can take physical form. Don't forget, it's written there, to show hospitality to strangers, for some have done this and have entertained angels without realizing it. And it makes you want to rethink hitchhiking. Entertain angels without knowing. When angels visited Abraham and Sarah in Genesis chapter 18, it, they appeared to be a trio of ordinary guys. Abraham showed them hospitality, fed them a meal. And that is exactly what 
the writer of Hebrews is referring. Fourth thing about angels is that they are male in name and appearance. Now again, we're, we're writing down what the Bible tells us. And this is not anything that we've chosen to believe about angels. This is what God's Word says. When you read through the Scripture and you read about the appearance of the angels, as they take on a physical form, it is a male form. And they are named with male names. For example, Luke 24, 4 says of the resurrection of Jesus, as the women stood there at his empty tomb, puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them clothed in robes. That's just an example of how the Bible refers to angels. Number five, they may or may not have wings. Now obviously if an angel yeah, we understand to be a spiritual being that once in a while takes on a physical form and is trying to look like a regular person, uh, he's not going to have a set of wings behind him. Might be useful for doing the Macarena, but it's not good for really anything else. However, in the Bible, when angels are described as being heavenly creatures, they are often represented as having wings, sometimes uh, as many as three pair. But then they are given different names. They are referred to as cherubim or seraphim, for example. Number six, Matthew 28, verses 2 to 3, tell us that they may be glorious in their appearance. So even though they look like a person, they can have a radiance of glory abound to them. This again is at the resurrection. Suddenly there was an earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and his clothing was white as snow. So it had a glorious appearance to it. The glory, again, is not their own glory. It is a reflection of the glory of God. May the same be said of us. Number seven, Luke 20, 34 to 36, tells us that the angels are immortal. You and I are mortals. We have a limited time on this earth. The race of angels do not experience death. Jesus replied to them, Marriage is for people here on earth. But in the age to come, those who are worthy of being raised from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will never die again. Now get this. In this respect, they will be like the angels. They will never die again like the angels. They are children of God and children of the resurrection. Angels are a race of beings that God created to be immortal. We receive immortality through Jesus Christ. Jude, verse 9, the angels are humble. The angels are humble. But even Michael, one of the mightiest of the angels, did not dare accuse the devil of blasphemy, but simply said, the Lord rebuke you. Now, Revelation 12 tells us that Michael defeated Satan when Satan rebelled in heaven. So he not only is the, one of the mightiest of all of the angels, but the one who personally took the devil down. And yet he was so humble that he did not rebuke Satan directly, but instead put him under the authority of Christ to do that. Number nine. Matthew 22, 30 tells us that angels are single. Here Jesus taught that the, when the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. In this respect, they are like the angels of heaven. And if all angels are male, that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Or if they are genderless, it makes a lot of sense. And it also makes sense because they are spiritual beings, not 
physical or material beings. Number 10, Daniel chapter 7 verse 10 describes a vision of the Ancient One. And in that vision, Daniel shows us that God made a lot of angels. Our New Living Translation Bibles here that we use in our pews here in church translates this a little differently than uh, many other Bibles. It says, millions of angels ministered to the Ancient One. Many millions stood to attend to him. And I think that they do that in a more modern translation because we're so used to big figures, right? Even a million these days is kind of whole home. Uh, if it's spoken about billions or trillions, well then suddenly we're paying attention. But it's a, an image of a, an innumerable group. Remember what we read in Luke chapter 2, verse 13? He said, a vast army of angels. You know, when he talks about the heavenly host, he's not talking about Bob Barker. He's talking about a vast army of angels. Number 11, at last. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22 tells us that angels have emotions. They're spiritual beings, but they have emotions. No, you have come to Mount Zion, writes the author of Hebrews, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to countless thousands of angels in joyful gathering. Hear that last bit? In joyful gathering. Like us and like God our Father, they have feelings. They have emotions. Now we'll get to the part, number two, how angels serve God. And we're, again, we're going to have to go pretty briefly through this. Uh, letter A, the angels serve God as messengers. In fact, the word angel literally means messenger. So angels are God's messengers. And during uh, the Advent season, we talk about how the angel visited Zechariah with news about his son how he visited Mary with news that she would have a baby, how the angel appeared to Joseph in a dream. So they're delivering all kinds of messages here around the birth of Jesus. And that's a good example. Second uh, function of angels, letter B, angels are God's agents. And you might know sometimes his secret agents. Angels are God's agents. They bring blessings and wrath. An example of blessings is when Gabriel appeared to Mary and he said, Greetings to you. You are highly favored of God. He blessed Mary and then went on to explain what was coming next. On the wrath side, Genesis 19.13 tells us about how two angels destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So they are agents of God's will. Third, worshipers. As worshipers, let us see, praising God in heaven. Hebrews 1.6 tells us, And when he brought his supreme Son into the world, God said, Let all of God's angels worship him. And it, I think we could say that worshiping God is possibly the most important job that angels have. And the same can be said of us. Worshiping God is the most important thing we do in the course of our days. Now let me add just one more uh, briefly. Letter D. This isn't on your notes. Just write it in the margin. Angels are God's warriors. Angels are God's warriors. And we've already talked about this some, so that's no surprise to you. They fight spiritual battles. They're God's soldiers. All right, third and final. What's the relationship between angels and us? One race that God created and another race that God created. 
And letter A, one of the things that is a little difficult for us to suss out is that Psalm 8, verse 5 says that men, people, human beings, were made a little lower than the angels. A little lower than the angels. But, letter B, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3, tells us we will judge the angels. And so that implies a, a rank a little higher, doesn't it? Here's what it says. Don't you realize we will judge angels? So you surely should be able to resolve ordinary disputes in this life. So Paul goes to the Corinthian church and they're feuding and fighting about trivia. And he said, listen, you people are going to judge the angels one day. Can't you figure out what color of carpet to use? Now the angels mentioned here are likely fallen angels or demons. But still... Maybe in the new creation, we get to rise in rank, and the human race gets elevated. Hebrews chapter 114, we've already read. It says that they come to take care of us. Angels are servants, spirits sent to care for who? For people who will inherit salvation. So angels are God's servants primarily, but they also serve us. They take care of us. In fact, go on to Psalm 91, verse 11, where it says they stand guard over us. They don't just take care of us. They are God's secret service over his people. What does it say? For he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. Now, this is where the notion of a guardian angel has come from, but unfortunately that term has been so mythologized in popular culture that it doesn't have its true biblical meaning. It's good. The good news is that God does send his angels to guard us, to protect us, and the better news is it's not limited to certain places or certain times. They will protect us everywhere we go. So what we've learned this morning, friends, is that angels are a race that God has created. They exist to serve him, but they are sent to serve us. Now, if we realize that and we accept that as being true, that means that we have a bit more biblical knowledge and we have a little better theology, both of which are good virtues. But my question is, what difference does it make in everyday life? And I think one of the big differences is to recognize in your heart that God loves you enough to provide a whole race of beings to help take care of you. Now let that feeling sink in a little bit. God loves you so much that he has sent his angels to take care of them. And I think the second thing that's important for us as we take this doctrine and this understanding and put it to everyday use is to realize that there is a spiritual and supernatural side to life. Now, I don't think we should obsess over it. I don't think we should blame our vices on the devil like Flip Wilson tried to do. I don't think we should uh, give angels credit for our virtues. But we need to, as we go through the course of our days, not get so wrapped up in our mundane uh, habits and our schedules and what we see around us and think that's all there is. <clears throat> It's not. The Bible tells us what is real is what is supernatural, what is spiritual, and what exists here is a copy of that. 
So we're living in the copier world. You know, after you've made a, a number of copies of things, sometimes they get a little corrupted by uh, that many times of being recopied. But we live every day in a reality that is spiritual and supernatural. And God has given us prayer and his Holy Spirit, his word, so that we are participants in that reality each and every day. Do you mind blowing yet? Mine was. Let's take a moment to offer praise to the Lord. We'll conclude our service by singing him, The Birthday of a King. Number 284. And even though we're singing about a birthday, I'm sorry to tell you we have no cake. You'll just have to imagine that. 284, birthday of a king.